Thank you. Thanks. So I feel like a bag lady up here with my stuff. But uh, so first of all, I like to start by just saying I agree with Publishers Weekly that this book is a triumph. So Thank it really you. is. It really is. But before we start, I want to sort out one thing. Uh, the press this week called you the Empress of Filth. You're not trying to steal my title, are you? Never, never. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I mean, talk about a vision of hell. This book is, is so great. You know, it's beyond the valley of Hieronymus Bosch. Um, so I just a few quotes I want to talk about. Uh, burning placenta that hisses in the fire, plucking out gray pubic hairs and swallowing them, cannibalism, whipping, dangling eyeballs, uh, beautiful grotesqueries, and, you know, yet it's exhilarating, this book. How does that happen? Well, all of those things are exhilarating, I think. Yeah. I mean, they're unexpected, they're dangerous, they're weird. Um, you don't really want to do those things. But you're happy that someone else is doing them. I, I don't know. So, I mean, this book to me seemed completely believable. I mean, the, the amount of research you must have done. I can't imagine writing a book that takes place in this time. How did you do that? Um, I, did, I, I did a fair amount of research, but not so much that it felt like I was tasking myself with writing something that was really historically accurate. I wanted to imply a sort of late Middle Ages rather than recreate it. But I'm, I'm glad that it you It seemed believable it to me, completely. Um, and I know you're probably sick of this question, but does ugliness inspire you? Ugly? I don't even know what, what is ugliness. Yeah, I agree. This book was beautiful to me. Thanks. I, I couldn't wait to get back to it and think, oh my God, but I love a feel-bad book, but this made me feel good. Did it? Yes, this book made me feel good. That's great. Didn't it make you feel good writing? Actually, it really did. Um, I, <laughs> I, it, it was probably the funnest book I've, I've written, and um, it was really escapist for me in the process. I got to go to this completely different place every day and meet new weird characters and imagine their entire life stories. And it was really fun. It was really fun to be in um, an omniscient narration mm -hmm. instead of being trapped in the interior of a, you know, a weird protagonist. I got, I got to sort of step back and uh, let my narrative voice be a storyteller and sort of weave the stories of all these people together in a fun way. Is this book ever funny? I don't know. I didn't. I, I, the, I didn't laugh out loud reading I it. I did. I didn't laugh out loud, but I gleed at some of the hideous things you put up. I mean, you know, it. I didn't laugh, but they were witty to me. Well, that's. I thank you because, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I didn't. It's it's such a dark time, and um, and we've been in such a dark time. I mean, I like it. It's a book. I, I think that it's supposed to be humorous, mm -hmm. you know? And if you take it too seriously, you might not enjoy it. Um, but yeah. But I, the details are so overwhelming. Like, either, even the sunsets are angry for not having their colors be more pleasing. Yeah. That's such great. You know, the nature is not the enemy in this book. No. It's Why the, would it be? Well, because nature is conspiring to kill you from the day you're born. Huh. <laughs> it, it, I, I always <laughs> thought it, of it more like time. Well, this to me, the nature, the birds are really the, yeah. the, the greatest characters in the book, aren't they? The most helpful? Well, they are. Yeah. They, they are, um, they know everything because they can go almost anywhere. They can, and they see everything from bird's eye view. Yeah. 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 No, but I loved how you described nature. And I'm not the kind of, usually I think, oh, God, more nature stuff. But this was like, the, everybody else was so hideous and nature was so kind of appealing. Um, my favorite, of course, is Ina. Is that how you pronounce it? Well, I call her Ina. Ina, okay. Ina 
rhymes with vagina. Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, well, she's an old blind wet nurse, but she replaces both her eyes with the eyes of a horse and then seems doubly big. Yes. That's so great. But <laughs> is, is that how you feel when you sit down at your writer's desk in a way? When you put on your writing mm. outfit, do you see things bigger? Actually, sometimes I do have a strange sensation that I'm like sinking and that the world is getting bigger, yeah. And how how do you write? I mean, do you do you have a schedule? I mean, how do you everybody wants to know that. How did this happen? How did you think it up? Well, um, how did I think it up? The, f the first seed of the book was really in Marek's story, the premise, the, mm -hmm. the thing that happens that kicks the story into movement, which is that this adolescent boy kills another adolescent boy and then is taken in as a replacement son by his mourning parents. Mm -hmm. So that I had that. I was like, okay, I think that's something. Yep. And then I sort of let it sit there for a couple of years, um, not thinking that I was going to go back to it until uh, COVID, and suddenly everything else is on hold, and I have this time and space and sort of opportunity and responsibility to write a novel. Um, <clears throat> so Marek's story was right there. And that gave you the idea to, I mean, do you think up first, this is a genre, I mean, this is going to be about the Middle Ages, that kind of thing. You knew that. Oh, no, I didn't know that yet. You didn't know it no. yet. Well, I mean, do you have a schedule? Do you write every day at a certain time? And No. I, if I'm drafting a novel, like a first draft, or, or even really writing notes, if I've committed to writing a novel, I have to write every day. But it's like the, I do what I think is my best work in the times where I'm sort of in my own blind spot. Mm -hmm. The last five minutes before I have to leave the house or, you know, right when I sit down after doing the dishes and before I have to walk the dog. So it's like there's a lot of waiting. So but you don't have a set time that you do it every day with a certain desk and the same... Do you write by hand I, or computer? Uh, I, you... write, I write in my bedroom. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I don't have a set time, but I'll give myself a goal of like this many words. But how do you write on a computer? On a computer. Okay, yeah. And... Um, are you a workaholic? I mean, as yes. soon as, yeah, okay. So, yes, she Definitely. didn't she didn't hesitate on that one, you know. So, when you first think up a book, do you have an editor that you pitch it to? No, I just write it. You you don't do anything with your editor first. You don't tell him what he she whatever. You don't tell them what it is or anything. You don't have to get the kind of green light. Well, no. I don't I mean, I guess I could. Mhm. Mm but it hasn't I'm, no, I'm too impulsive, I think. And then how many drafts do you do? Usually? Oh, like 50. Uh-huh. Yeah. And what draft is the first time you show it to anybody? 40. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and who is that? Um, usually Bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my husband, Luke. Uh-huh. And my best friend, Rosie. That's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. And so do you ever read it out loud or tape it to hear how it sounds? No, but I did record the audiobook. Oh, you did? Book. I was going to yeah. ask you that. And Isn't it weird when you do the audiobook? It sounds so much worse because you say it out loud and you look at some shock technician that's working there that has no idea who you are and you're talking about, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so you have not had to deal with sensitivity editors? Oh, um, I mean, maybe I—I I probably didn't. You'd know. I, I probably didn't catch on if that was what huh? they were trying to edit out. Maybe it went over my head, but. Um, but so no. once you turn the book in, then what happens? Um, once I turn the book in, um, I I'm, get some notes. Yeah. I think about them. Mm -hmm. I uh, either incorporate them into the manuscript or ask, you know, what did you mean? have a conversation about it, and hand in another draft. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but not the sensitivity thing. You didn't have somebody, there is such a thing at many publishers that have ours, mine just didn't ever call back. But, um, <laughs> but you didn't have to go through that. I don't think so. Because um, my friend Bruce Wagner turned in his book, and uh, I like his books. I don't know if you've ever read them. But no. he, uh, the sensitivity editor said he could not say the word fat. He couldn't do anything. And, yeah, and so all these rules, and it really is a thing that does happen. Today. Even in fiction? Yeah, and it was a person that was purposely trying to eat herself so she was the, weighed more than anyone in America. 
And so but he's trying to tell that story. They said she story. couldn't say fat. Well, you always have to be funny with that. We call, you know, when we were looking for hairspray, we didn't say we're looking for a fat girl. We said we're looking for an ample woman who's proud yeah. of it. You know. So you didn't really have to go through that on any of your books, political correctness, none of that. I don't think so. Well, you're lucky. That's good, you know? The first book that you wrote, you know, it was about a homophobe. Somebody revels in the violence and filth of life at sea. How did that just come to you as your first idea? You think it's about a homophobe? No, but he is, right? Well, he's closeted. I mean, he's... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, okay, he's homophobic because yeah, yeah. he's afraid of his own homosexuality. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So that's fair, then. Yeah. But, um, it, but... but <laughs> Is it hard? I mean, you know, unsympathetic characters, which I love to read too, because I you might not want to hang out with them, but they're great fun to spy on. Do you spy on people in real life? Um, um, I I have been known to be somewhat of a snoop. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you always ask questions? I you know, like I'm, I'm mostly an observer. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I might ask some questions after I get to know someone, but. It's more like... But do you spot... <laughs> I mean, do you eavesdrop? I do. Um, I, do you? What, what, where's your favorite place to eavesdrop? Airports. Oh. You know, and I, I see people walking off a plane. I do an exercise. I make up a 10-second bio of each person. Father hates her. Mother fucked her. You know, like a whole... Oh, my God. Go through the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> what, what would you think if you saw yourself walking off a plane? Oh, God. Don Knotts meets Mahogany. <laughs> um, now, like many people, Eileen was the first book of yours I read, and uh, I instantly became a wild fan of it. Uh, but she was unsympathetic, too, in some ways. She wanted to be raped, she had food issues, suicidal, worked in prison. Um, did you ever teach in prison? No, but coincidentally, and this was like one of the weird um, sort of phenomena of writing period, is that as soon as I started writing Eileen, the themes in that book started appearing in my real life. Mm -hmm. So, like, my sister took a job in a prison. My, um, someone very close to me was incarcerated. So I was having this, you know, did I manifest this horrible <laughs> situation? But, um, but I've, yeah, I've been to some prison. I've visited some, yeah. And uh, do you follow true crime now? Yeah. The, the Escape from Down America. Did you see that yes, one? That I was love a great that. one. And how about the new one where she killed herself when they caught him? Oh, Pam? Yes. The, yeah. yeah. Wait, was that Pam? That's the one yeah. in, uh, where was that? In Alabama. Yeah, that yeah, was yeah. good. Where she helped him escape, and then when they caught him, she shot herself. Oh, wait, in the no, car. I'm thinking of That's something else. That's a recent else. one. But so you do follow true crime. I, I mean, <laughs> clearly not as much as you do, but. <laughs> oh, no. I, I do less. I do less. But um, so Scott Rudin originally uh, did this book. He did. He, he optioned it, right? He optioned it. Yes, that's fact. Right. Well, what happens when you have a friend that gets, you know, I was in a Woody Allen movie. I didn't give the money back. <laughs> well, well, okay. So, you know, this isn't, this isn't specific to my experience, but if a producer options the rights to a book in hopes of making it into a film or a television series, they're paying to, to, to rent Mm -hmm. the rights basically mm -hmm. so you don't pay back rent like i i yeah. if i say okay i want my rights back i you know he he's invested in it what happens is if he doesn't make the movie you already know this if he doesn't make the movie a new producer a new makes produ it yeah. that new producer pays him back if he is or if that new producer is using the script that scott rudin Developed. Why are we talking about this? Well, I'm wondering because he's in the news and was Me Too and he, everything. He so, was, yes. do, what do you do when that happens? Well, would you still, if he had bought it, would you? What, what do you do when that happens in your life, creatively, with someone you know? I mean, I know people has happened to it. It's a dilemma. Uh, my, what do you do? But he wasn't Me Too. No, he wasn't. He was, he sort he was of me temper asshole. too. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But so you would still work with him? Um. No. I mean, <laughs> the the thing is. Everybody knew that Scott was a very difficult person, to put it mildly, but he was somebody who got movies made, and it seemed yeah. like everyone would say, oh, but then they would go ahead and work with him. But and So when the news first broke, um, my instinct was like, oh, this is really bad. 
But everyone in the industry was like, oh, this happens every few years, it'll go away. And this time it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been with friends with somebody where it did happen, you know, that has been me too or suddenly it's canceled? Yes. And did you stick with them? What did you do? I mean, if you ever get arrested, I'm the first person that will call you that morning. I, and and I, I will. And so did you stick with them? No comment. Okay. I know what you mean, <laughs> because then you get it. Uh, to me, if someone was convicted and they admit it and say they're sorry and try to make themselves better than the person they would be before it happened, they deserve a second chance. Well, are we talking about legal issues or just Both. someone Well, I, I, how can I say I try to get people out of jail that have committed murder? So, you know, I can't suddenly say because somebody pinched somebody once or, you know, right. the, I don't know. But I think many of the people like Harvey, I'm, you know, good. He's glad he's there. You know, uh, I hated Bill Cosby before rape. Oh, I was, uh, you know, <laughs> I was really disappointed by the Bill Cosby. Yeah. I, I, cause I grew up on the Cosby show. He was like a dad figure to me. Really? Well, so I think betrayed. the jury's out right now, I think for the, the oh. second one, you know? Um, who were your early influences when you were a re Were you a reader as a kid? I was a reader. I mean, my my I read books that were totally beyond me when I first started reading, um, like Gunter Grass. <laughs> my my mom had a friend who was German who died, and she got his entire library, and half of it was untranslated. But anyway, so I read a lot of weird German literature, and. Um, I don't know, like the classic sort of d depressive teenage stuff, like mm -hmm. Catcher in the Rye, Anis Nin, I don't know, D.H. Lawrence. But not like Burroughs or... I never really got into Burroughs, yeah. actually. Yeah, and Genet and that kind of thing. No. no. But you like Charles Bukowski. I always hated him. I just think he's a great humorist. Really? I thought he was like a drunk you'd move away from. I know, I'm he in the minority. I mean, it sounds there. like he I'm was. really in, in the minority. But Visions of Hell, which were your first Visions of Hell you liked? Oh, my God. Well, I remember being in the crib at the babysitter's <laughs> waiting for my mom to pick me up, knowing that she was late and watching the the headlights sort of flash around the room and thinking, I'm in hell. <laughs> but was that bad? It was horrible. Oh, I thought maybe you were like as a kid, I love hell. Well, no, right. but, it, but it was, you know, it's like one of the first times I can remember being aware of my thinking. And but so, when did you start to write it down? When's the first oh. story you wrote? Or oh, I don't know, probably like sixth grade, mm -hmm. something like that. But I didn't, I don't know. I didn't really get it until I was like fully teenager. And then you started to write, beginning to have the style that you, what you became. Yeah, I mean, it took a very circuitous route, but I really think I found, I, I, I found myself as a writer when I kind of threw away what my expectations were and started writing more about my own experiences, and that's sort of how I found a voice. But you were encouraged to do that. See, in no. school, I was not. No, yeah. I was not encouraged to do that. Mm -hmm. That was something I like. I defected, and I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you were a you worked on a punk bar in China. How did that happen? Um. So, uh, in two thousand two. No, sorry, 2003, I moved to Wuhan, of all places, with my then boyfriend. And we had no idea that um, this, this randomly, this case, so back then you could get a job teaching in China as a native English speaker off the internet. Mm -hmm. And it was really easy to get a, a, a visa to do that. So that's what we did. We found jobs on Craigslist and two weeks later we were living in Wuhan. Um, and we taught English at a university and we didn't know that Wuhan had like this really vibrant underground punk scene. Um, but you know, you spend enough time in a place and you know, the, the Wuhan was a, we, we were in sort of the, like almost in the countryside. Wuhan is so big that you can still be in Wuhan and actually where where the university was, was the old airports where these enormous boulevards on one side and then like uh, like farms on the other. Um, and it was really cool. And then you took a bus and you were in this in incredible metropolis. Anyway. So was the <laughs> punk rock scene important in your development? It, it was, I mean, to, to a certain extent it was. I mean, I didn't know where I belonged, but I gravitated toward 
other people who felt like they didn't belong. I but guess. how about punk writers? I mean, like Kathy Acker. I mean, did you feel part of that? At no. All? Okay. I don't think so either. I mean, I don't think your work is experimental. Do you? I mean, that's that, a horrible word. I know. I yeah. think so too. You know, people say avant garde. That's even worse. But um, yeah. So I want to get back to one thing I forgot with Eileen. So it is a movie now. It it, it will be. A, I mean, yes, it's in post production. That's yeah. great. Tell me who's in. It. I don't know anything about it. So okay. Who's, yeah, um, please. So, Coming attractions. Uh, okay. It's directed by William Oldroyd, who's a British director and really, really excellent. And um, yeah, Anne Hathaway plays Rebecca, uh -huh. and she's fantastic. And Thomason McKenzie, who's a, a very young actress from New Zealand, plays Eileen. Mm -hmm. And she really makes Eileen like her own. Oh, it, that's it's great. great. Were you, did you write the screenplay? I co-wrote it with uh, my partner. And were you on the set? No. Because they usually we, don't like the writer. Well, we shot it during Omicron. So mm -hmm. I visited the set the day before the shoot. I got to see Eileen's house in the attic, but I didn't, I wasn't there for the shoot. So are you a movie buff? Eh. Like? Com compared to... Well, what'd you like lately? Oh, man. Oh, my God. Okay. Have you ever seen Shakedown? The TV show? No. No. It's, okay. I'm, I hope I'm getting the name right. It's, um, it's a documentary by Leela Weintraub, and it's on Criterion, but it was premiered at the Whitney, and then it was on Pornhub. It's a documentary about the last lesbian strip club in Los Angeles. Oh, God. And it's amazing. It's really good. What was the name of the bar? Sh th that? I don't remember. God, Cheryl Crane took me once to the last lesbian uh, lipstick bar in LA that was all glamorous, dressed oh. up lesbians. It was amazing. It this was is like really the opposite. Good. Yeah, yeah. This is the op well, there are the ones in Baltimore where everybody looks like Johnny Cash. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so are, are you going to write more movies? I mean, do you want to yeah. write screenplays? Yeah, I enjoy it. It's, it, I feel like it's, it's, uh, thinking about how to, movies work it makes me think differently about how novels can work and what I appreciate about a novel that you can't do in a movie and vice versa have you written screenplays that were not from your books have you do you have some screenplays out there you've written um yes really you, can you tell us one not no. okay I get it I get <laughs> it I get it but that's good I didn't know that about you you can never have too many careers that's, that's great true. that's great um so homesick for another word was short stories yeah. are short stories closet novels what what do you mean <laughs> are they all just waiting to be novels and oh. haven't come out yet I don't think so. No, okay. uh, that's not how I think of them. Yeah. May maybe, you know, a short story is a failed attempt at a novel once in a while. But I really see them as their own, their own, they're a totally different animal. And do you think you can take more risks in a short story or a novel? I think in a novel because you have more pages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how important is plot? I, th you know, I used to think it was like really stupid to think it's about what makes plot. a hit though. but it is it, and I, I mean now that I'm embracing plot I was just like oh there's like this incredibly exciting element in fiction that I hadn't even thought about before yeah, yeah. so yeah it's great. so when you're writing a novel do you outline it um yeah I've started to do that I did mm -hmm. I I did not do that for my year of rest and relaxation mm -hmm. and it really drove me crazy it was I mean maybe it would have been impossible to outline that book but um, not having had a plan and suffering through like the last hundred pages like 20 times in different forms, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to outline now. So in other words, you didn't know the end. I didn't. Because mm -hmm. that's the one thing Jonathan Galassi, my editor, asked me when I pitched through the uh, liar mouth. He said, do you know the end? And I did. You it did. changed, but I didn't know it. Yeah. yeah. And to me, you know, I learned so much about plot. To me, is the hardest. You know, for me, characters are easy to think up. I love thinking them up. But the plot's the hardest, and the plot is what makes a hit, kind of, I'm afraid, a lot of times. Especially in a movie, they say the first 10 pages are what it get it produced, and the last 10 pages are what makes it a hit. Well, yeah, because you want people walking out being like, wow. Right? You do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you most definitely do, yeah. Uh, um, so was my year of um, wrestling, like, was that your biggest hit? Um, I don't know, yes. It, 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 it felt like it maybe was, you know. Um, and why do you think so many people identified with it? They did, probably oh. more than any of your books. Well. And it was before COVID. Maybe, I mean, you know, it's so funny because I get a lot of different reactions to that book. Some people come up to me and they, they're, like, very sincere and they say, you know, this book, uh, like, I read this book after my mother died and, like, I felt so close to it and it really helped me through my grief. And other people say, like, oh, that was so hilarious. Like, I read it three times on the toilet, you know? <laughs> so I think it might have something to offer people in various states of being. Um, but I also think like it's a fun, it's it's kind of fun to imagine just sleeping for a year, even though it sounds really boring. Did you ever read about Stephen Tennant, the great eccentric English person that went to bed for 15 years and people just came to visit him in bed because he said scenery made him too giddy? You, oh, he, 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 he first saw a flower when he was a child and fainted. It's, oh. a, it's a book I think you would like. Wow. Um, uh, I, I said the L London Review of Books said it's a psych about uh, my year of rest. Uh, psychological um, realism with most of the pleasure removed. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Do, do you agree? No. <laughs> I know. Well, but I think it, I know what they meant. They just were, you know, humor impaired. But um, do you. I mean, do, do reviews get to you? I mean, do you read them? You said you don't. Which I said I don't, and then with Lapona, I did. And then well, I was like, that was a big mistake. Well, the never thing is, how can you again. not read them? You know, in a way, if you get the New York Times every day. Like Valentino used to have a newspaper. He only read good news. They would hand him his newspaper with big things cut out, which is really ridiculous. But well, that's kind of what you have to do. Yeah. But, you know, you just get, oh, you read the bad, the bad ones you read, once and the good ones you read twice and you put them all away is my advice i just to skim yeah I, I like that's what i've been doing the last so you've never weeks. learned anything from a review like not to read them yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and see to me i built a career on bad reviews which <laughs> is impossible okay. to do today but with a book like this one you're gonna get some because yeah. it's so extreme in such an amazing original way that not everybody is gonna react to that no, you, that's true. when you turned it in weren't you nervous i know when i turned in this book i thought this could go either way didn't you, did you feel that no okay that's great so you have confidence definitely you're not worried about when you turn in a book like it is the ultimate homework assignment when you turn it in so um don't you, you aren't nervous? No, I haven't, no. That's great. No. That's, that's really great. I mean, because it's, uh, like, what, what do I have to lose? Well, four years work. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if I think, if I have spent four years working on a book and I don't believe in it, I already no, know. No, you believe in yeah. it. Yeah. But suppose everyone, oh my God, this time you've gone to, suppose somebody said that to you. I mean, I'm sure it would hurt my feelings, but I, yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? Well, that's the question. What do you do? Yeah. Um, you know, this movie is certainly in the book. You really made fun of the art world. Did you work in the art world? I didn't. You didn't? No. But do you have contempt for the art world? <laughs> I mean, I think I, the art world is an interesting um, metaphor for all of culture because it's, you know, it's, it's part of the capitalistic system, and yet it, it's exploring, exploding, exploding. It's exploding. It's exploiting what people find like sacred about the human experience, which is just what culture is. See, I love the extremes of it. I hate art for the people, but <laughs> um, but uh, it's like a biker club or something. You have to wear certain clothes and know the language and look at blank paintings and talk about the beauty. I love all that. But I felt you didn't <laughs> in the well, book, definitely. I mean, I don't know. I love art, but I yeah. don't necessarily love culture. Yeah. And how about shrinks? How about shrinks? I mean, you had a bad shrink in this book. But see, I believe in them. I've had good ones. Have you ever had a... You've had a bad one? I've, I mean, all of the psychiatrists I've had have been horrible. Really? Yeah. I only had two, and one was really good. But I didn't... 
You mean the kind where you couldn't look at them and they never said anything? That kind? I mean, the kind or that her, like you walk in and they're, they're already writing Prozac. Oh, know? no, I never had any that gave me pills, ever. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, okay. So but you're, talking, yes, are you talking yeah. about like a therapist or a Well, yeah, but they're a psychiatrist too. They don't all give you pills. They tr may try to, but yours did. Yeah. But I think that's like having bad health insurance and living in New York City in the early 2000s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But so you don't do you go to one now? I mean, maybe that's too personal. private. Yeah. <laughs> Mine did, and I went back. I hadn't seen him for years, for forty years, and I found him again. I thought I need a touch up, right? And I went, <laughs> and he said, "Well, we figured out a long time ago why you do stuff. Who cares now? You're seventy-five. Let's just make the rest of your life happy and do what you want to do. Who cares why you want to do it?" I thought that sounds like the best shrink I ever heard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> So, you've won a lot of awards. Where are Me? they? You've won a lot of awards, yes. Where are they? Where do you keep them? They're not... Uh, these... <laughs> <laughs> I can think of one award. No, you were nominated. Your awards. I didn't write them all down, but you no. did get they're, different they're, awards. They're just like these ethereal things that exist <laughs> on the internet. You don't actually get a... So, you don't have like them sitting on Oscar. your desk. <laughs> no. Right, right, right. Um, Death in Your Hands was like a great fucked up Nancy Drew book to Thank me. You. You know? um, so it was an old idea. Um, Liar Mouth was for me too. It was something it? I had that in a folder a long time ago. So, but um, do you recycle? If let's say if you have an idea for a book and it doesn't happen, do you use those characters in different things? And sometimes by accident. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll start writing a new short story, realizing like three years ago I already started this story, mm -hmm. and it could and I could be word for word. That's how sort of weird things get trapped in, in and so brain. you have started a lot of books that you're saying that never became real i have so many files that are i mean whether they were books or just me trying something and then sometimes i'll go back to them years later and, and you know suddenly it's clear to me and i know how to do it mm -hmm. so they're like old friends in a way yeah. that are put away and they're like yeah. acquaintances yeah and um do you feel it's up to you to surprise your readers each time by doing something so different I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to repeat myself. That's so humiliating. And I'm sure I repeat myself anyway, but to do it deliberately would be well, very Well, didn't Alfred Hitchcock say repeating yourself is just called style? Okay. <laughs> I mean, for example, I mean, Eileen, you know, Eileen was my, like, real debut novel. And if I wrote another novel that, that felt really similar to Eileen, I would probably feel like, okay, I've, I've just narrowed my path, right? Mm -hmm. So I, it, it's important for me to try different things or else... Now, but you've tried other things. You were a fashion model. Oh, my God, no. So was I. We both did. We're top models. I, yeah. I believe so, it about you. Yeah, no, but, but tell me when you did it. When I did you it? You did it. For, I have it right down I, here. I, 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 I walked one runway. <laughs> for who? I, Which designer? Mariam Nasir Zadeh. Mm -hmm. she's, she's really cool. And um, I was petrified. I thought, I mean, I went into it. I was like, oh, this is going to be so easy. I've been walking for 41 years. <laughs> and um, I, you know, came onto the runway. All these people were here. And I literally forgot how to move my arms. I, yeah, it was, it was bad. Then I went the wrong way. Somebody grabbed me by the shoulder. Did you have to change outfits or just No, one? it was just once. And did you pout and look angry like they looked? I think I just was, like, yeah. horrified. <laughs> <laughs> but you follow fashion? Yeah, I like fashion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think you should continue modeling. Thank um, you. So you're, tonight is kind of the beginning of your tour, right? This is the beginning. And, and so how do you feel about that when you tour? I mean, it's, it's part of it, and... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious how it's going to go. I haven't been on a book tour since my year of rest and relaxation because mm -hmm. Death in Her Hands came out during lockdown. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited that, uh, you know, people are coming out. That's amazing. Um, I really love the book, and I'm excited to share it. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I try to look at the tour as kind of like a, a little insane vacation. From and, life. and how important it is, do you think, to keep in touch with your readers? I, I think it is. I, I think it really is for you. Yeah, it um, is for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's important for me. I don't think so. 
But, well, it, I mean, the things that people say to you and the people that, I mean, you have smart fans, I bet. Oh, I know. They're all brilliant. You know, and they, they want some edge and they're not going to, you know. So, so, but when you meet them, it's like you see them for real, you know, for I the know. first time. It's actually and it's very like, moving. It's kind of, it is moving, you know. And uh, Elton John said to me, the day you stop touring, it's over. Someone's ready to steal your place, young lady. Oh. Yeah. So, don't blink. Um <laughs> Do, do you go right into the next one? Yeah. You've already started. Well, I, I'm, I already feel like I'm waiting. Yeah, I've been waiting. But I'm not asking you what it is, but do you... So you know, right? You don't have to ever search for what the next one is. No, I have like a backlog. Uh-huh. Yeah. You do. Yeah. And then what estimate do you give? Like your next book, how long do you think it'll take? It really depends on what my schedule is like. But there's one book that I've been writing for, what, like four years now? And um, it's really hard. Um, so, you can write two books at once? No, I mean, I have to put that one away. Uh -huh. And it kind of feels like I'm, I'm, the, the work I'm doing now is for that book, so like, to teach myself how to write you know, the, next, the next part. And so the next one, so you're ready. But you then, you don't have to pitch it. You don't have to say to it. Have you had the same editor on each book? Yes. Okay. So you don't have to say to that editor, whose name? Scott. All right. You don't have to say to him, this is what my next one is. I mean, I'm sure I could say that, but I, I kind of just pull him out. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and do you read a lot of novels? I mean, what no. Have, no? <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't read a lot of novels. I tend to read more nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Um Mostly because if I'm working on fiction and I'm reading fiction, I, 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 you know, it's like if you're listening to the same album, like you sing it in your head or you whatever, you go on a jag. And if I'm reading too much fiction, I'll just start, I'll forget how to write my own. I see that. And do you listen to music when you write? Um, no. I don't either. Do you dream about it when you write? Um, I sometimes dream that I am writing. Me too. Yeah? And then I write down what sounds so good in the dream that I wake up, it makes no sense. You can remember it? Well, I write it down in the middle of the night on a pad, oh. and then it makes absolutely no sense when I read it in the morning. I can yeah. never remember. Yeah. But you do, especially if you're in the, in the middle of writing a book. And do you try to end each day when you know what you're going to do the next day? No. You don't? Mm -hmm. So there's no tips you can give writers. Oh. I mean, I think the tips are like... Um, Follow to the extreme your curiosity and practice as much as you can. And when you do a first draft, do you just go all the way through and not keep rereading it and rewriting it? Because that's the hardest, I think. The yeah, first that draft. is much harder. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I do sometimes a combination of both, depending on where I'm at. And then I don't read the whole thing until I've finished the whole first draft, and I think, oh, my God. You know, mm -hmm. it's like when you finish a movie, and then you finally look at it the first assemblage, you think, oh, my God. This is the movie you made, not the movie you thought you were going to make. So is it like when you first read it, do you always like it, or are there times when you think, oh, my God? Well, the first time I read my first draft of Eileen, I decided to throw it away and um, was really upset. You did literally like shred it, throw it away. No, I mean yeah. I was like this. You know, this was a this was a failure. I can't do this, and I decided I was just going to let it go and you know keep writing short stories and try to get a job doing something. I don't know, but I woke up the next morning like like really missing her, mm -hmm. and and then I had like what was eventually the epiphany, which was so obvious that I had written the first draft in the third person. So it had a complete, like, the, the perspective was completely different. So I was like, oh, Eileen has to tell her own story. So I just rewrote it. And but that person, sounds like a major rewrite. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. But, you know, the characters, the story, they were all there. And are there any other writers today that you think are kind of like you in your school or in your, do you identify with in any way their work? I don't know. I, I have to read I have to read my contemporaries to, to answer that question because I'm not I'm not keeping up with what's coming out. I mean, A.M. Holmes or I oh, don't know. She's fantastic. I mean, uh, Catherine Harrison. I don't know. She wrote the Kiss. You know the one. And, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I'm just wondering if there's any Mary McGarry Morris. Did you ever read her? Mm. She wrote a great book called Vanished. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's any you feel, and I'm not saying they're like you, but if you feel that anybody you've influenced or you've been influenced by today. Mm. I can't, I, I mean, no, I don't know. I'm so bad at answering those questions. No, you're me. not at all. But I'm just saying there isn't one, maybe. Is transgressive a dirty word? No. No, I think it is, kind of. <laughs> well, th doesn't you think it puts off readers? Does transgressive mean you're trying too hard? I mean, is it good or bad? I don't know. So what's that sign say? Questions? I can't read it from you. You think I can read from that far in the dark? Okay, good. So, all right, we're going to do some questions in a minute. Yes. So, um, I forget the question. Oh, so transgressive. transgressive is you take it as a compliment. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think of it as just innovation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. you certainly do that. So, certainly. All right. We have some questions here that I'm going to do just at random that okay. people have written in because I guess they were afraid of what you'd ask, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, all right. Do you want each novel you write to stand on its own, or are you trying to build a body of work with connections between each book? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, definitely, I, I want each book to stand on its own. Um, there definitely is a connection between each one of them, and that's that it's part of my own <laughs> experience writing them. Um, so I see them as a development like, I can put them in order and say, oh, this is when I started doing this, and here's where I stopped doing that and got really interested in this. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I think you can kind of see my, my mind shifting book to book. But do you think if somebody said to you, I've never read any of your books, which one should I start on? What would you say? Um, it depends on who's asking. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. usually I say, oh, maybe you should read Eileen, because if you read Eileen, then, you know, and you yeah. like it, yeah, yeah, and right. Maybe right, you'd yeah. like the rest. All right. Can you talk about your fascination? Oh, first of all, I have a question. Did we have faulty toilet training? Me? You and I, because they always say we write about shit all the time. You know, they love to say that because I know. Pe because people love talking about shit. <laughs> I know. And people then they say, oh, they're always talking about it, but I, then they're using us talking about it as an opportunity to I talk agree. about it. I agree. And the, the New York Times once about Pink Flamingo said that I had faulty toilet training. My mother said, you did not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, in all honesty, um, I do remember the last time I pooped my pants. So I must have been old enough to have a memory. And don't you find before. it horrible that we have to do that every day? Yes. Me too. And I, I think it's, yeah, the only good thing about dying is we never have to shit again. Although yeah. sometimes yeah. Th that happens, though, after. Yeah, it does. And that's why you don't ever want to get the electric chair because when you, you shit yourself on top of the I mortification know. of it. So whenever they say, what's your last meal, get a single leaf of arugula. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I just wanted to get that out because they both yeah, no, say that we write about one. shit and puke a lot. But I think you, the shit in this book is fantastic. Thank you. I just wanted to say. Um, <laughs> Can you talk about your fascination, maybe obsession, with depravity, even gross detail of humanity that you mine in your characters? Why does this interest you, and do you identify with these characters yourself? Why does it interest me? I, I, always, I always felt like it was so absurd that we're all pretending that we're not real. Like, it felt like, I, I mean, I remember having that thought in kindergarten, like, why is everyone acting this way? And I didn't know what way it should be, but my experience of realizing that I was alive and among other people and that I like, lived on a planet and that I had a certain amount of time here and then I'm going to die, was like mind-blowing. And so everybody else seemed, seemed to be very comfortable with that, except for the odd like crazy person. You know? But you just explained why you write. Well... To figure that out. Yeah, maybe. To or, make sense of it. Or, or, or to make it uh, useful. All right. Both of you are well known for highlighting characters who are considered unlikable on the surface. What draws you to telling these stories? Well, I think maybe we... To me, I just 
maybe don't want to hang around with them, but I love spying on them and thinking like them. Mm-hmm. Because I always look at people and think, oh, thank God I'm not you. You know, <laughs> life, life isn't fair, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's not fair. There's no such thing as karma or anything. So when you see some people, you think, what is it like every day to be them? And that's what interests me. Mm-hmm. And I think it interests you too, trying yeah. to see people that maybe are nothing like you or anything or who act in a vile way. But why do they act in a vile way? And I think that if you get close enough to someone, you start to see their depravity. I mean, it's not that, like, the the only characters on earth that are, you know, depraved are the ones in my book. <laughs> it's that everyone is like that. It's that I'm shining spotlight on them and letting you, letting you, bringing the reader really, really close up and, yeah. and really, really inside and that's where all the shit is. You know? <laughs> all, right. all right. I think we have time for one more. Am I correct? Okay. So um, let's have somebody yell it out. I like an audience question. Does anybody? Yes. Oh, my God. I didn't hear the question. What was it? If, Who would if, divine if play you, in your books? No, okay. If, if you could adapt... If you could, you can yeah. adapt any story. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I would do you, Eileen too. You would Eileen. do Eileen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. of the short stories, I'm kind of thinking. Um, I don't know. The one that pops into my head is is called The Beach Boy. Do you Tell know me that story? It, I... It's about this sort of el- not elderly, like this couple in their 60s in Manhattan. They go on this vacation to this exotic island or something and they come back and they're chatting about it and telling their friends and they mention that like on the beach there there were these boys who kind of like hassled you and they were sort of horrified when they realized that they were prostitutes yeah and that night they they go home after their dinner the husband makes some popcorn they're going to watch a movie he comes with the popcorn and the wife is dead he's devastated He goes to pick up some photographs that she had dropped off from their holiday and finds one with this strange boy in that, like a mistake photo Mm -hmm. that she had taken of one of these boys. And so he, he, he's, it's like, you know, he's kind of reborn in the uh, rage of realizing that his wife, who he's, you know, lived for his whole life may have been, you know, kind of pervy Mm -hmm. and cheated. Yeah. Um, so he goes back to the island to find the boy. I don't know. Now that, that sounds I'm like a good it, script. I, I, I could do know. that one. Yeah, that's not good. It sounds enough. a little bit like suddenly last summer. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, there's yeah, got to yeah, be a better yeah, one. Yeah. Oh, it sounds great. Well, all I can say <laughs> to wrap it up here is this is a great beach read if you're crazy. So I'm just telling you, take the book. It delivers. It delivers. All right. Thanks, John. <laughs>